welcome to World Minister Summit. I'm thankful to here to the OP Jindal Global University and Professor Raskumar for inviting us on, on this particular topic. In this particular session, we are going to discuss, we are going to read upon beyond ranking metrics, need for substantive reform in education governance. And for this, the panel, which is comprises of, so we have Professor Dr. Nishiful Laila, this is a professor and Vice Dean Resources Faculty of Economics and Business at Arlanga University, Indonesia. We have Professor Dr. V.C. Vivekanandan, is a Vice Chancellor at Ayatollah National Law University, India. We have panelist three, Professor Kihara Han, is Director, International Law Training and Research Hub at University of Tokyo, Japan. We have Professor Atul Koshla, is a Vice Chancellor, Sulani University, India. Comprises with Professor G.S. Vajpayee, Vice Chancellor, National Law University, India. Under these all eminent speakers' guidelines, they, they, they have idea, they have practice, the entire concepts of this ranking, rating. We have panelists, those who have published a lot, they are having a lot of experience as a vice chancellor or as a dean research or as a resource vice dean research into the university system. Professor Hunt, she is graduate from the Human Security Knowledge and she is a director in Japan East Asian University. She, holds, she also worked on the focal point for this competition university systems. Similarly, we have Professor Baspe, Professor Koshla, Professor Kihara, Professor Hunt. They all are the person, those who have worked in this area. So today's topic, today's point, which we are going to discuss here, that is, as I discussed, that is more or less based on the uh, ranking and entire system. From, from being a bench, no, backbencher, two decades, University ranking have moved on to take the front row seat within higher education. This particular two years when everything was on stake. So definitely these two years has insults us. So from being a backbencher for these two decades back, the university ranking have moved on, on to take the front row seat within higher education sector. Now it is no more a budge word. It is the driver of universities and even the entire higher education system of countries, shaping policies and the processes that are now geared towards improving the institution or nation's position in this global ranking or that. Now from the end user perspective, this ranking have become a crucial metric for their decisions on the choice of university where they will pay the fee. And after all, most nations are moving away from the public financing of higher education. And it's students who end up with paying the fee. In a global competition for the talent, universities are using their positions in ranking table to attract the best faculty and the students across the globe. Yes, ranking have also evolved over the time. We, we all are vigilant, we are, are uh, witness of that, that it has been evolved over the time with more dimensions has been added and captures into the numbers. The positive outcomes of this focus on ranking is that has brought the discussion on the quality of education in universities at the center of the globe. It has forced even the most led back administrators to take note of initiative some changes, but it has some, it has created some chaos on this. With the university administrative looking at a very decision through the tint lens of this ranking, the question arises that what impact this policy or step have on the ranking on the universities? What are the problems that this extensive focus on ranking can create or it is creating? And what are the other ways through which universities can focus on the quality? Is it only the ranking through which we can instigate, we can focus on the quality? By, by folk trying to focus more on the ranking status, what type of challenges we are facing right now in the university system? And we can think about that what should be included 
beyond the ranking, whether this mat metric of the measuring is sufficient enough or it require more interventions in, in the future. So on, on this particular topic, we, were, we are going to discuss with the panelist. The question arises here that yes, we are trying to focus on impact of this policy and the steps on the ranking of the universities. So there are questions arises. There are a few questions which is there. I would like to request uh, panelists and invite panelists one by one here to, to speak on, first of all, what you think you can take time, two to three minutes and tell us that what exactly the problem is right now. I'm going to provide you a basic thing here that look, when we are talking about the ranking system, so what are the aspects of the university operations? that ranking in their current form are able to capture fairly, is it accurate? The question is, is it fairly accurate? So my question, I would like to put forward this question here. First of all, I would like to invite Professor Nesifu Laila. Professor Laila, the, the key point which we are discussing here, that what are the aspects of the university operations that ranking in their current form are able to capture fairly accurately? What is what is your view on? Yeah, thank you, uh, Prof. Krisan Pandey, and very nice introduction of this discussion. Uh, yeah, I'm from Erlangga University, who only currently joined the QS uh, Wood Ranking, and now the uh, Wood Ranking University Ranking as well. And I can uh, tell you. Uh, the difference about the culture of our university very clearly from like last uh, six years ago when we uh, didn't follow any uh, university ranking and now we uh, jump up from ranking three, 700 uh, six years ago and now we are in 369 uh, university rank. Uh, uh, of, of course, I agree with you that there are uh, some uh, homework that that maybe <clears throat> some uh, something that not uh, fairly accurate uh, from this ranking. But the positive way of this ranking is uh, we all now understand that we we cannot just uh, doing business like usual. We have to encourage more each of our faculty member, each of our staff uh, of education to give more and to uh, serve the quality more than before. Because now uh, in the uh, uh, international communities, we are uh, everybody wants to ask something like that. So now we understand that we need to have a culture to uh, have a habit of uh, research and publication and also internationalization. We just agree with you, it is very costly, especially for me from Indonesia, we, just, uh, we still uh, 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 we still battling with the uh, funding and so on. But uh, that positive way is uh, now we understand that uh, it is something that six years ago we don't think we can do but now we can do that and we also have so many benefits from the university ranking global ranking that from our alumni uh, from the student itself and then the industry is trust a university even better more and more there is something uh, that we don't have six years ago before we joined the university ranking but of course, there are something that after six years, we are uh, jump up from 700 university rank, global rank, and now in six, uh, 369, we understand that there are some part that uh, should be uh, give uh, focus more, not only how to catch the rank, which is the ranking only measure heavily on uh, research, publication, and citation, which is now we know that it can be fabrication. It can be uh, people can do it uh, with with uh, with uh, less uh, moral and ethic way to have that. Uh, it's also need to emphasize on should be. Uh, on the uh, impact of the education itself, the quality uh, of the, uh, uh, what do you call it? How we deliver knowledge to our students, not only the research itself, not only the publication, not only the citation, internationalization, especially like Indonesia, we have uh, more than 200 million, of course, India much higher. That 
national uh, interest is maybe we need to focus more than internationalization. Even though we, we understand that internationalization give very good impact as well to the university, but uh, we then understand that uh, lately we give too much effort to the internationalization, too much uh, funding for the research and citation and the rank, rank itself. We have to come back. We have to understand that the main business of the university is to educate a student, to give a high quality uh, lecture to the student, to produce knowledge, not only publication that tend to be uh, predatory, like you said in the introduction, and also uh, to give impact to the society. Why, uh, what, what for? We have a high rank, uh, what rank if we don't have impact to the, our society, to society in our uh, uh, Indonesia, in our country itself, and hopefully the world. But uh, that's something I think need to be captured more from, from the university rank or uh, other ranking uh, because the uh, the impact of the society is need to uh, give focus more and also the quality of the uh, delivering uh, knowledge to the student. I think that's uh, first for me, from me, uh, Professor Christian. Thank you. Yeah, Professor Laila. So yeah, you you are uh, you are trying to focus on here that the the current form of ranking it it has you know it need to be evolved in order to capture more fairly accurate. Yes, obviously you, you are right at that point. What happened that uh, the ranking has been designed to capture the various dimensions, but in spite it has been designed, it's still it is it is neglecting either uh, some part is neglected or captured wrongly, or or capture no bare bone of the university ranking metric system. Although they are the central to the purpose of any university, what what uh, you think, uh, Professor? Uh, 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 Vivekanandan, that the current, what are the dimensions which which is either neglected or or captured wrongly or captured bare bone for the university ranking matrix right now in the centuries? Professor Vivekanandan. Thank you, Professor Pandey, for uh, uh, thing and uh, I was I was intently listening to uh, Professor Laila when she was giving her opinion. So let me start with a remark, which, uh, which I'm very fond of, uh, which will in a way summarize uh, uh, part of the, this theme. This is about uh, Cardinal Newman, who was the founder of the University of Dublin. He once remarked, a liberal education is not about what students learn or what skills they acquire, but the perspective they have on the place of their knowledge in a wider map of human understanding. And this is a very interesting quote. What he said that we are talking about set a product line of what is entering and what is coming out, but rather he says it needs a much, much broader vision that what we are universities are the one which talks about skill sets as a smaller part, but how do they place the whole worldview? So in that context, also coming from public law school background, and uh, from law, my perspective has, has been that to an extent, parameters are important for accountability. For a certain extent, it's a roadmap. It is certain extent allows focus. But the point is, as uh, the earlier professor said, we are talking knowledge and education as a universal mission. So obviously, an emphasis on ranking talks about you know, who are in the front runners or who are laggards, and then that has an entirely rather negative impact in certain ways. I distinctly remember in one of my early days when new people joined my postgraduate course when I was in Alsa, I used to ask them to introduce themselves, a few words about what they are and where they come from. When they were introducing, I found uh, one student said about why, they, why she wanted to do the course, all that. But she never told where did she the undergraduate. So I thought uh, uh, she forgot or something. So I told her, uh, you didn't mention, which is your alma mater. She was smiling sheepishly. Okay, sir, she said. I said, please, why don't you tell? Probably she comes from a school, which is non-descript in way. And she felt in that crowd not to tell about her school. 
So then I have to give a small lecture to her that I consider it's my pride to teach you coming from there rather than teaching someone who's coming from the top. So I said, as a teacher, I am more focused and interested on people who are low in the ranking within the class rather than who are on the top of the ranking which can take care of themselves. This is one big dilemma every teacher will face where we are really talking about non-discrimination in any way within a class, many things. In such similar way, in education system, if it has a too much competitive quotient, then my proposition is you are losing on the compassionate part. Is very simple as that. And then competitive part will have a market terms. And then the one there will be laggards, which will be you know left over. So this is a crucial part which I say. But as far as as I acknowledged in the beginning, that ranking and other things should be in a in a manner of trying to see uh, differential strengths, etc. What to do? I give an illustration of my own university, where and anywhere in India compared to that, we have thirty eight percent reservation for tribals. The All India reservation is seven point five. In Chhattisgarh, I have thirty-eight percent, which means they are first time, maybe the first time graduates coming. They are just first in the family coming. So I always, I was arguing with the earlier net chairman that how are you comparing me as a university with others with a very generic ranking system? The kind of inputs what I am giving to develop a huge sector needs to be acknowledged. This I was talking to Mr. Jagdish, who uh, is currently the UDC chairman, who was also part of NAC. I was telling that you are you are taking that you are talking about equal opportunity and the differential outcome but the question is there is no equal opportunity then you cannot talk about an outcome measurement in similar way this is my generic answer as i said that uh, ranking and other things do uh, play a role but in the hierarchy of things i consider ranking is not that it is a contribution and you know what you do to certain special developments or catching to certain things, this should be one of the primary things which should be driving a universal education system. I will stop at this point, maybe listen and come back later. Thank you, Professor Dandan. Uh, you're absolutely fine and right at that point that we do carry that perception somewhere back in the mind and even in the students. Yes, you're absolutely right at that point that there are many parts, many things which is being neglected there or capture wrongly in the ranking system, and that can create some problem also. Question arises, yes, there's a gap, there's a lacuna. Then where does the society or, or public services are actually fitting into the framework of this ranking? Whether are these, these uh, uh, collateral damage caused by the higher focus on the ranking to the education system? So I would like to request Professor uh, Kiara Hunt to just give us enlightenment here that where does the society and, and the public services fit into the ranking framework? Are, are these collateral damage caused by the high focus on the ranking? Professor Kiara. Okay, that's a very interesting question. Um, I think uh, uh, points that were raised by previous uh, panelists about uh, the importance of quality of education, importance of uh, uh, um, thinking uh, thinking over uh, ranking um, is uh, absolutely correct. And a society, um, I think uh, Professor Laila uh, mentioned um, uh, that it should be, uh, I'm missing the exact word that she mentioned, but um, in the direction of um, impact to society, I think, right? Yes, um, yes. Yeah, so um, that was exactly what I was thinking when I uh, started thinking about this session. Um, so ranking, um, if there are diversity of ranking and if there are rankings that can capture uh, the relationship between the university and the society, or how much university is responding to uh, to current issues, contemporary issues, but also issues that are not normally uh, reported by the media, the deep issues, uh, philosophical issues, and you know, um, combining different issues together to look at one's phenomena or one situation. Um, I think. Um, if the society can play the role in that, so so in a way, university is needs driven um, to uh, fill the gap um, 
uh, of not only knowledge, but it's um, more about uh, understanding of the world or uh, perspectives to look at the world. Um, I think uh, that would uh, then fill uh, the problems that we are facing with ranking. Uh, if we use the ranking system, and uh, I, I'm working for the University of Tokyo at the moment, which is uh, very high on the ranking, but some pers some aspects we do very badly <laughs> um, to admit. Um, so, uh, you know, if we are thinking about how uh, we are responding to requests from the society, I don't think we are doing too well. Um, or if we are to look at inclusion, um, of diverse ideas and diverse uh, sources of knowledge. Uh, we are very academic driven, of course, we are an academic institution, but there are other things that uh, we need to take into account in thinking about the world. So um, I think society can play the role in, uh, in uh, identifying the needs. Uh, the university needs to look out for what the society needs, how we can contribute uh, to the society, global society, um, by uh, educating, researching, and uh, interacting uh, with the younger generation. Absolutely, absolutely fine, Professor. That's the ultimate responsibility of education or universities. Yes, uh, Ghalib says somewhere, sometime, that education is something which is reflected in your behavior. <laughs> All degrees, mark sheets, affiliations, which is hanging on the wall, is merely the receipt of the expenditure which has been done on education. They're absolutely right that, yes, it is very important to reflect and showcase that what education is all about. So if education is able to impart its contribution to the society, or public services, then it is actually the real education. And definitely there, there is need to evolve and evaluate here to check that how the ranking frameworks are actually deeply <laughs> in that area. Beside that, what happened, it has been seen that majority of the ranking, major, major part of the ranking is focused on research. Majority of the part of ranking, they focus on research and then insisting towards the producing the research. Even, even the focus on the publication is very high. When they say research, research means publications. And this has turned universities into a paper churning machine. This is a research which says that much of the what being published is not being read. And there has been no positive change in the volume of the groundbreaking research, which is coming out from the university systems. Even there was a nice uh, statement given by Professor Higg, is, who is a Nobel laureate. He said that I don't think so that I will be fitted in the existing educational system. Uh, no, they, they would have been fired me because I, I am not able to publish the volume and the variety is right now it is going on. So question arises whether do, do we think that it is a fair criticism and ranking are not making the, the real impact on the quality of research? Whether we are pressurizing professors or systems to churn the papers and papers and papers, sometimes putting n equal to two, n equal to three and changing the context, changing the demographical variable, what is the practical application of those research? So I would like to invite Professor Atul, Professor Atul Kosla, to, to highlight here because it's a very important point because it has been perceived now that the ranking actually uh, turned the universities into a paper churning machine. What is your view, Professor Kosla, on this point? Uh, thank you very much, uh, Krishan, and uh, let me greet all my fellow panelists for this. I think a good question. Uh, but I, before I answer this, let me step back a little and I'll pick up from uh, Professor Vivekanandan spoke, which is, what is a great university? Why do we exist? And I think it's a first fundamental question we need to answer. And in my opinion, a university is about creating knowledge. It's about creating leaders pushing humankind 
and uh, moving us towards achieving impossible dreams. And that's been happening over thousands of years since the concept of universities came into place. I think a university is also a place where leaders in their own right come and converge. Uh, that's what happened in Takshila, that's what happened at Oxford. So any great university is a place where great minds come together and they create knowledge. So we're talking about creation of knowledge, and I'm going to link that with research in a second. So research to me is about creating new knowledge, and I'll come and answer a question in a second. But before that, I'm going to make some very strong statements. Uh, I have lived my life both sides of the same coin. I've been in corporate for a large number of years. I was in consulting with a firm called McKinsey and Company. I've been in academia for the last 15 years. So I've got four strong statements to make. So hardcore academicians don't mind. Number one, universities were created in the pre-industrial era. If you look at Oxford or Cambridge and the others, they were created around 1,000 years ago. And they are designed for the industrial era. So most universities across the world, almost everyone, are designed for what happened 300, 400 years ago. We live in a world of disruption and we have to think very differently from the way universities were created. Secondly, universities do not know how to measure any KPI. There are no measurement systems in most universities of the world. As a result, they are amongst the most inefficient users of capital. And I can say this again, they are amongst the most inefficient users of capital because they don't know how to measure anything. And there is no way they are measuring impact in any particular thing. So coming back to rankings, why it's important. We need some framework, Krishan. We need something to say, is this particular university having an impact? No particular ranking system anywhere in the world, whether it's for universities or any other thing, is perfect. But there needs to be some particular framework to measure whether we're having impact or not along different dimensions. And I personally particularly believe that uh, ranking frameworks are great. They give us some sort of a dimension to measure ourselves. As far as Shulin is concerned, we are young, we are very new, we are capital scarce. But we are today India's number one private university in the Times Higher Education. Uh, we are 350 to 400 in the world globally, and QS, we are number three amongst private universities in India. So why is this important for me? It's important for me because when I look at the parameters and I look at how do I measure uh, Shulani, I start seeing some of the best areas that I need to look at. For example, let's look at research. Now, if we look at rankings mainly for the purpose of achieving rankings, I think that's wrong. But if you look at rankings as a way to achieve a better university, then I think it's a great way to measure success. Now, your question was on research. I think it's not understood many, many times that research is not about going back and taking knowledge uh, out there and making societal changes because basic research many times is very, very critical. In fact, there's a research paper done by a very a uh, respected scientist from Oxford who says that if no one had worked on the electron, the atomic uh, structure, X-ray would not have been created. And it takes thousands of scientists to put it together. So research publications are important because you're out there doing the research, you're documenting them and making sure that different people can quote them, can see your pieces of work and make that whole jigsaw puzzle together. I'll give a specific example over here in the terms of uh, something called photocatalysis, where Shulini University is a leader in the world. So photocatalysis is nothing but using some photocatalytic material and light to create a reaction in water to create hydrogen and oxygen. If you can do that efficiently, we will be solving the purpose of uh, fuel in the world. Right now, we are at a stage where it's probably going to take another 50 years before it's going to be commercially applicable. There are probably 100,000 scientists across the world working on the same problem. But if no one works on this problem, Krishan, this problem will never be solved. And, and the world will always be fuel scarce and we'll always be going out using fossil fuel. So my point is very, very simple. Number one, rankings give us some framework to go out and determine whether we are in the right direction or not. Number two, research is an important criteria for universities because we are in the business of creating knowledge. Secondly, 
learning by research is way superior than learning in the classroom and writing things because learning by research is when you're doing experiments, you're forming the ability to hypothesize, you're forming the ability to design an experiment, you're forming the ability to assimilate data and you're forming the ability to write, which is also a very, very important skill. So for students who can write research papers, file patents, it's a absolutely fantastic way to go out and understand how to be successful in the world. Coming back to the topic of autonomy and governance, which I think is also very, very important. And I'm going to take half a minute talking about over here. I think uh, what we're missing in this discussion is the whole objective of governance and the importance of governance in a university, which I think at this juncture ranking frameworks do not capture. Great universities will have great governance. Great governance means continuity of vision and policy. Great governance also means autonomy. Autonomy by the regulators, autonomy inside the university and academic freedom and research freedom. And I think these are the things that will make a great university and a university that does not do research, does not publish, will perish. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Khosla. Thank you for highlighting the very important point which is actually you know, need for substantial reform in education governance. Yes, indeed, this is an important part. And the ultimate objective, the beyond the ranking, we have to think about the reforms to, to which we should be imparted there into the education governance system. Yes, absolutely. Your point is very valid, sir. The point which we are telling here that, yes, it is important to go through to ranking, but whether this ranking has caused us in a different way, whether the universities are, are just trying to focus only on the paper churning, which has no use. You know, we know from the Indian context that research was neglected initially long by the university administration or faculty because it does not impact their funding. Now, we know also that the rise in the pressure to publish have resulted in, in rising of the predictory journals and other unethical practices. And that's why uh, even, even in uh, December 2020, UGC has started mandate paper for the PhD student that is the research and publication ethics, that we should know at least that what is research and publication ethics, it is important. So what structural changes can, can these universities leaders make? You are a leader, uh, you, you are leading a university, we have a prominent speaker guest here, Professor Vajpayee also, who has a long list of experiences. If I'll start reading his experiences, even half an hour will be not sufficient. So what structural changes can universities, leaders make within their institutions to overcome this dilemma, this dilemma? I would like to request Professor uh, G.S. Vajpayee to put forward some point on this, that what specific structural changes can university leaders can make to enlighten their faculty member so that they publish, but they also did not impact their funding. They did not also pressurize to publish in, in predictory journals. So I would like to request Professor G.S. Vajpayee to put forward his point. Uh, thank you, Professor Pandey, and uh, good afternoon to all uh, present. Uh, actually, there are very compelling questions which you have raised. And I would start from the basic premise. Uh, your ranking becomes relevant to the extent you understand the idea of an university. We have traveled a long journey from being a very, you know, primitive kind of institution in this country to become a very liberalized institution. So whether the ranking is doing justice with us or not is something very important. The things which I am going to speak on or speak about, I have relied uh, two very powerfully written article by Professor Ajit Pathan. When he wrote uh, a couple of months ago, obsession with the ranking, he was essentially talking about uh, uh, ranking and branding. Now ranking and branding, uh, as if we are privately dealing with a industry who is selling the products. The universities are not the industries and we are not selling the products. Therefore, the core concern remains as far as ranking is concerned, is the obsession with the ranking that goes on because it stimulates our egos. It activates our war instinct. 
It encourages brand consciousness and promotes the rapidly growing publication industry, which you are talking about. But the problem is the manner in which the ranking framework has been set up. Your first question was the aspects of ranking. Mainly, we have created a framework which is numerically dominated. And here, Ravjit Patak also says mathematics trumps and nuanced ways of seeing the specificity of a learning community disappear. And therefore, he says at some place that if IIT Delhi is ranking, uh, is scoring 86.76 and Banaras Hindu University is, uh, is scoring 63.10, what does it mean? Does it give any idea? Does it does it compare anything? And 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 very interesting thing which I would say when he says that uh, we have actually created a, a situation where we are only talking about uh, some numericals. So paper per faculty, citation per paper, uh, inter inter publication in international journals, and we have actually. Uh, we have created a smart uh, set of professors who believe in branding and who can probably be they are a smart professor because they know how to publish. And the number of publication is increasing. In fact, the qualitatively, they are not contributing. Professor Koshla and Professor Vivekananda was indicating about the creation of knowledge. Who cares? And you tell me where in the any ranking framework, where the originality of ideas where the creation of knowledge is tested. I'm telling you, you can measure what you can actually measure. You cannot measure what you can't measure. There are a lot of things which are subjective and qualitative in nature and qualitative in terms of uh, uh, so many things. So university ought to have a soul. Now, when I say university ought to have a soul, or a spirit that nurtures the joy of learning and unlearning. It should encourage the experiment with truth, celebrates the academic and cultural pluralism. And above all, it should be a reflective, critical, emancipatory thinking. It should encourage. So in fact, that spirit has been killed over the years because we have probably uh, driven, we have, uh, we have driven our faculty to churn out the papers as many as you can without realizing. Now you tell me, uh, uh, IIT, uh, uh, university or NIT, uh, they will attract a different type of employability and employer at attention. But liberal art, cultural anthropology, they will not. So do you think that they can be relatively superior or inferior? In fact, the problem is uh, with the very methodology. I am not against ranking, but I am against the methodology of ranking. If you are at all putting the ranking, you are creating a hierarchy of institutions on false belief and false parameters. I have written a very powerful article in Hindu a couple of months ago, where I have demonstrated, you can see this article available in public domain, where I have shown that a university is acquiring 100% uh, uh, public perception score in NIF ranking framework. However, they are not getting good number of students. How come this happened? If you are, if your perception is 100% and your admission rate is just 30%. And I'm telling you, there is a, my problem is, I'll come to those structural change, which you have asked. We need to create those structural changes, which should create the avenues to think original knowledge, create serious, it may not be too many in number. We are counting the number. My problem is counting number is a bad idea. If you go back to the, uh, idea of university, the fantastic book written. In that book, they are talking about the creation of knowledge in a very different way. I'll, I'll give you a very simple illustration where in, uh, say for instance, in Indian uh, ranking framework that is called the NIRF, there is a huge amount of data fuzzing. I have written this and I'm, I'm seeing that the universities are using the same set of data. So suppose my university has to be ranked and I am a university with multi-faculty. So I mean, on all the faculties, there is a different set of resources available. I am pulling all the resources and showing it in law faculty. Again, I'm showing it in man manage management faculty. So when you are ranked in management, your number is one. When you are ranked in law, your number will be made. This is happening. You can see this is in public domain. My problem is that university, the qualitative aspects of ranking, the philosophical enjoyment of learning, 
critical pedagogy that matters. Now I'll give you a final example and probably I'll close. I'll tell you. So for instance, no ranking framework at any place in the world takes care of the quality of teaching. You are talking about quality of research, but teachers are appointed mainly to teach the class and they are not being assessed on the quality of teaching. You are, you are not appointing teacher to do primarily research, but you are measuring the research. You are appointing teachers to, to teach, but you are not measuring the quality of teaching. So I think structural changes are needed within the university, the universities which are teaching centric, and they, they take pride of nurturing the generation by quality teaching. They should be given a lot of space in ranking. I don't know how this can be done, but I'm sure methodological changes are needed within the structure of the institutions who are responsible for that, to be able to really give a right kind of, because we are unnecessarily creating a hierarchy of institutions. I'm against this hierarchy. Knowledge cannot be you know, created in this manner. Knowledge cannot be sort of created in a hierarchical manner. So I think I will stop here and if you have other uh, things I can- Well, well covered Professor Vaspey. The... You, you you absolutely you know highlighted at the nail point that yes there's need to reform, and what there's a question uh, for you also from the audience that uh, what role can accrediting bodies and the government agencies play in shaping the ranking metrics and, and education governance policies in the public universities of India? Uh, if I if I again continue to add, I would yeah, say yeah. This question for you. The question is that what is the role? There's this uh, no role. Can this accreditation bodies and the government agencies play in shaping the ranking metrics and education governance policies of the public universities in India? So I I, I have said, uh, Mr. Pandey, that two things are very important. First of all, uh, we need to actually uh, start appointing the research faculty and uh, teaching faculty little differently. If you are, if you want a research intensive university, you appoint researcher, but teaching has to be done. And in the governing governance structure, at uh, 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 it has been just mentioned that leaders have to be appointed very carefully. There is the system of the appointment of leadership in best of the best university is very flawed. I think we need to revisit it. And I am saying we need to create the policies which are commensurate with the demands that we have today. So on the one hand, we have market driven demands. Fine, you can allot, allocate some portion of your functioning to satisfy that requirement. But you should not forget the fundamental objective of the institution of uh, university. So I think a lot of changes, accreditation body, that's what I'm saying. You are giving A++, you are giving, I think the parameters and the indicators of uh, a university have to be widely debated and discussed. That is my suggestion. Absolutely fine, Professor. Your point is very valid here. It seems that because the faculty members are usually expected to teach as well as do research. An university may a higher ranking on research, but do do these high ranking research translate into higher quality of the teaching practices? You have highlighted very well that what type of intensive structure can be created here for the systems in order to increase the quality of research as well as quality of teaching, because that that's matter. There's a very nice uh, question which has been here. I'll, I'll request uh, uh, Professor Vivekanandan. Professor Vivekanandan is a question which has been asked by one of our PhD students. So the PhD student asked question that Ivy League Institute, respectively law school, announced that they would withdraw from the ranking system last November because of the profound flaws in the uh, methodology. So her question is that, sir, what are your views on it? And how do you think that it will impact the ranking system? Uh, you, you are on mute, Professor. <laughs> said, uh, can you again come back to the exact question? The question is that the Ivy Lake Institute, respectively law school, announced that they would withdraw from the ranking system last November because it profoundly flaws methodological distinction, school from helping disadvantaged students. So a student want to ask, sir, what you what is your views on this? How you think that this is going to impact the, the ranking system? About the withdrawal you are talking. Yeah. 
Right. See, I, I wouldn't, uh, in the sense, uh, I cannot understand the context and uh, the depth of that of withdrawal. But what I was trying to put across is from the beginning uh, that um, the ranking is not the foremost thing. It is an incidental thing, number one. Second, what I want to tell, I'm not commenting on individual institutions coming out, but I would say that let us remember in a larger context, all education institutions all over the world in different nation states is certainly a creation of the state, whether it's private or public. If the state is involved even in private, even in public in terms of setting the, you know, uh, what I call agenda setting role. So there is an intention for the states. Every state wants to have its uh, rightful place globally. So there is a competitive element which is coming there. The second part is the legitimacy. This is where there could be a difference in different ways. Legitimacy really means the state resources. How much the state resources uh, in terms of competing things, what has to go, that will also again shape in terms of what you get. So that has also has an important bearing when you're talking about ranking. What are the kind of resources? Third, I would consider whether you like it or not, there is something called ideology. For example, I can illustrate what could be ideology, not in a very core political theory, but for example, when South Africa became independent, what should be South Africa's priority in terms of their education? And what are the priority of the United States is different. But in my opinion, if I look at uh, all the rankings, generally what is happening, global rankings, it is flat. It does not, in, it does not factor the distinctiveness. It does not factor the challenges of you know, certain regional and certain sectoral things, what they are contributing. So then it becomes, as Professor Bajpai was uh, beautifully pointing out in the beginning of branding and thing, we are talking about a certain level of ISO 9000. ISO 9000 works in, in a product range because, uh, and to an extent, I would even say, uh, globally, science seems to be literally universal in terms of you know coming to that. If you leave that outside the science, when you look at it, you have a huge expectation, huge variation, and huge contribution. So one way this topic, what you people have done, which I have to thank Jindal, is seriously looking that uh, not all is well, the so-called ranking, and there seems to be some kind of I would say that comp the, a kind of race happening. And that might lead to even factoring things, how to get the ranking. So you orient uh, one of your questions I saw in the 10 questions. I don't know whether you have time to do with the other speakers are waiting. So the point what I saw in that was you are ranked of what you do or you are gearing the whole thing to achieve a rank. I consider if you're gearing towards to achieve a rank, I think we have completely lost the wood for the trees. But if you are if you are looking at a natural phenomena and doing and that is being analyzed as you are good in this or you're good in that area, that seems to be, I would call a bit of celebration, I would call it. And to capture and move on that. But to tell that this is your ranking is your goal. And are you running and racing towards it? Then I am telling you, we are missing completely, as we said, the question of knowledge, the question of universal education, the question of each and every individual, you know, as a participative chance, all that gets down. This all I would comment, I wouldn't specifically comment about withdrawal and things like that. That could be a very particular situation. I'm not so much uh, clear about it. Thank you, Professor. Thank you very much. You're absolutely fine and right at this particular point that definitely the priorities and the structure should not be, you know, there is a top-down approach and bottom-up approach. So we should understand that what exactly we would have to follow it. Absolutely fine. There's a one interesting uh, question was coming and which has been discussed uh, from the era of this uh, ranking that yes, this higher education is a you know, uh, resources intensive business. Ranking is creating its own perception about the quality into the mind of the students and the society. The perception of the human resources, about the industry, about the system which has been next. So question is this, that are these rankings disproportionately having a negative impact on universities that serve the disadvantaged section of the society? I would like to request Professor Han to comment on this question. 
Professor Han. Yeah, that's an interesting question. Um, yeah, I think I would, uh, in, in short, I think, yes. Um, I mean, the first point is that there are different kinds of rankings. So there is a global ranking that we saw, uh, we, we see. Um, there are like national rankings. There are different like di um, alternative rankings. And so um, we may be talking about different types of rankings. Um, recent rankings, like alternative rankings, tend to look at those things that are not only publication, number of publications, um, they also look at, for example, um, professor student ratio, for example, or satisfaction of students, you know, perception of students. I think that um, captures a lot of things that um, uh, previous so traditional uh, ranking system uh, have missed. Um, but um, uh, so if we're talking about like traditional ranking system, talking about numerical um, things that the Professor Baj, uh, Bajpai have been, uh, has uh, raised, um, I think then that would have a disproportionate um, impact, negative impact. I mean, some universities may um, get a big profit out of the very flat ranking. Um, some universities may be um, mistakenly ranked lowly. Um, I think it's very important to look at the university uh, with the quality of teaching as uh, uh, professor, both Professor Laila and Professor Bajpai have raised, but also as a role model of the society. Uh, we are raising the leadership. We are also um, creating how people may think. Uh, it's not only about knowledge creation. I think it's part of it to to um, uh, create knowledge, um, to go deep and uh, uh, find out about the, the facts and, uh, and create knowledge. Um, but uh, if we are to think a little bit further, why we are doing this, um, it is very important to think about long-term impact of universities being um, it's our not only our research but our teaching our being how, how we are and um, oftentimes what universities do or university professors do or how universities run uh, how universities raise students to become you know uh, soon they will become um, adults and they work in a society they they uh, we are responsible for that <laughs> generation so I think we need to be a little bit more mindful uh, when we are talking about ranking, uh, that uh, it's not only about how we are right now, but it's also how uh, how what we are doing now will impact on the next generation, how the world will be changing because of our research or teaching. And uh, that would probably um, be an important thing to uh, remind ourselves. Um, yeah, thank you very much. Sure, yeah, it's a really, very, very nice point, which has been mentioned here that is required to understand that 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 particular point of view, because uh, right now, what exactly being done that all all ranking, this ranking paints all the institution with the same brush. So there, there are some questions which arises because of this reason. So I would like to request uh, Professor Nishapur Laila that what you think, Professor Laila, that will, will the institutions to be better off if they uh, internally benchmark against their own goal and performance over the year and externally benchmark against the universities uh, serving similar niche as, as themselves? What do you think on this point? Yeah, <laughs> thank you, uh, Professor Pandey. <clears throat> Yeah, uh, in Erlanga University, before we are joining QS ranking, we have our own goal as a university, which is uh, at that time, and uh, we, we didn't realize that we need to broaden our goal to more impactful, to uh, have a, a benchmarking with other university in the world. And what I think is, uh, if I agree with other uh, professor here that if we uh, have a ranking only solely for the rank itself, of course it is not so wise, and uh, so so much uh, money uh, involved is in there, which is also unfair for other for other aspect of the. Uh, a business is university, which is not uh, measured by the rank itself. The quality of teaching, I, again, I I'm, I'm, uh, agree with uh, Professor Pifakandan, uh, 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 I think. Uh, <laughs> that it should be also main uh, focus of the university because university is to uh, raise a young uh, student 
to be the next leader. As a leader, they have to have a creativity of thinking. They have to have a leadership skill that we need to uh, focus on, uh, to, to shape for the student. And also uh, the most important thing is skill to solve the problem. I think all that aspect is not measured by the ranking. That's why, uh, Maybe uh, it's, it's good to stick on the university goal, but it is not also uh, wrong entirely if we uh, have a focus on ranking, as long as ranking is not chased by the rank uh, solely as a rank itself, but it's a process, naturally processed by the university to have a better, uh, we have a better governance and then the better quality of teaching and then better quality of research when uh, where the research can in, uh, increase or uh, can be uh, increased the quality of the teaching. And then, uh, as I mentioned before, the impact, the impact of the university itself to the society, the impact the university itself to be part of the problem solver in the nation and in the world. Thank you. Thank you, governess. You raised a yes, very important point. Uh, Professor Atul Kosla also mentioned that what exactly its importance is all about. The educational governance is actually indeed very important. So, keeping this point, I would like to you know ask uh, Professor Atul Kosla the last question: That sir, the quality of institution is often is an outcome of quality of its leaders. You you absolutely agree on this point. And if things need to be improved, we need to focus on the university leadership and governance. What can be done to improve the institutional leadership capacity, specifically when several higher education systems are expanding very fast and good leaders are thus in a short of supply? It is a demand supply gap. So how to handle this situation, Professor Kosla? Well, very good question. Yeah. I think uh, uh, three, four things to be kept in mind. First, Great professors need not be great leaders. I think that's a very important point to look at. Great researchers need not be great leaders. And we need to differentiate between uh, great, I would say, professors or researchers, academicians, if you want to put it, versus people who can drive change and build great institutions. I think one big challenge we have today is that we correlate the two together. And we assume that if you're a great researcher, you've got some great citations and or you've been a high quality professor, you can go out and build an institution. So I think that's one thing to be kept in mind as we think about talent. I think the second uh, biggest challenge in the world, I would say, is that uh, unlike uh, most other sectors, there is no institution that is actually training our academicians to become uh, become leaders and uh, and and create uh, uh, create opportunities for them to become leaders. I'll give a small example over here. This is true for administrators. It's true for people in consulting. It's true for corporate leadership. Uh, we we shuffle people all across. For example, I might be uh, specializing in marketing. For example, uh, I might be working for a firm called Unilever doing marketing, but to make me a better a leader, if I'm in the path to be the CEO, I'll be put into an HR role, I'll be put into an operations role and groomed to be the CEO of, uh, of Unilever over time. So I think that's the first thing we should also experiment with, which I'm trying to now do actually to say that just because uh, I am a specialist in engineering, why cannot I be the dean of the business school, for example, where today we know there are huge overlaps anyway, because we're talking about multidisciplinary education. So can we create paths for our academicians where they don't only have to specialize in the area of specialization, but they can actually take leadership roles beyond uh, the area of work. So I think that's for leaders like us, vice chancellors, to create those paths for people that we see as future leaders of the world. I think the second uh, part which I also have is that there's a need for uh, a leadership school, uh, an academic leadership school in the country uh, it could be done in the private sector, it could be done in the, in the public domain, but I don't think there's any leadership program for academicians to go out and understand what leadership is all about. It's basically learning from their experiences that they become leaders. I think the last thing I would like to add over here is, uh, and it's linked with governance, is the role of uh, 
professional development and HR. And uh, again, this is from my experience that universities in general do not understand uh, how to manage HR as effectively as uh, people in other sectors do. So having a very robust uh, HR mechanism, which is probably incorporated from best practices from other industries can also help you and develop professional paths for people that you believe will be future leaders, I think, and help solve the problem. But I think the biggest problem in India today is we have 1,200 universities today. Uh, they've grown from 300 to 1,200 in a period of, I think, um, eight or 10 years, which basically means uh, 800 new vice chancellors and uh, 3,200 uh, deans, directors. And that's a huge number that never existed. And as I go around meeting peers of mine, I see major uh, leadership gaps. So I think together, all of us need to solve this problem. Uh, some of us can play a major role in doing that. And uh, uh, the answer is very clear. If we do not have great leaders, we will not build great universities. Thank, thank you. you, for thank, you Professor Kursla, thank you very much. We are actually had up time two minutes, but still, I would like to request Professor Vajpayee that Professor Vajpayee, what you would like to say on this you know, scarcity of the leaders in, in, in education sector? What is your view on this? So actually, there is no, as yeah. being said, that uh, there is no conscious effort for leadership development in this country. We think that leadership comes as, it, as if it is very normal. I think in this era where the institutions are getting professionalized in terms of its focus, emphasis, you need to have a very specific set of his skills and knowledge. And for that purpose, I think you need to have that component of uh, like uh, Professor Koshla said about the HR management. We, I always realize that a lot of manpower remains unutilized. I don't have time to elaborate this point, but I know that sometimes we recruit indiscriminately people and there is an increased and huge burden on the institution because there is a lot of people who remain unutilized for ages in this university. So I think this HR management, resource management, uh, curriculum management, academic planning, these are very, very niche areas these days. And I think there is a huge scope of developing some professional skills in this particular sector. So I agree that uh, let there be some kind of uh, professional development program. And I think when you, when you do the recruitment, I think the neck of leadership has to be assessed. This is very important. I agree that uh, academically someone could be extremely good, but to run a university, you need to have a different uh, kind of a skill. And, and a lot of universities as a result of this, because you don't have some time vision to, and you may not foresee the outcome and impact of your own policies in, uh, in times to come. And there you fail. And by the time it causes huge loss to the university in both economic terms and manpower, manpower terms. So I think that this is a very valid point from this discussion, which is emerging, that let there be some systematic system of enhancing the leadership capacity in this country as far as educational institutions are concerned. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Uh, we have already passed three minutes. So let me summarize what exactly we started discussing about the, the uh, need for substance reform in education governance. And very interesting point has been mentioned by Professor uh, Nishifu Laila here. She focused on the impact on society, how it should be. Professor Vivekanandan talk about that, yes, quality education is important, but again, how you perceive how you go for this uh, ranking system that need to be, whether it's a top-down approach or bottom-up approach, yes, sir, it's an absolutely fine thing we have to, we have to go inside. So Kiara, she has also mentioned that how it is going to impact and design in such a way that public or society inclusion should be there in order to complete comprehensive report of this. Professor Koshla, you have highlighted a very interesting point that yes, merely not the, the uh, ranking, the educational governance need to focus. And then later on, we discuss that how come the scarcity of leaders can be managed and we should work vice versa. And again, Professor Vajpayee, you absolutely are right that we should try to understand that whether we are creating a research institution or teaching institution or both. And then according to that, we have to take the strategy. I'm happy to, to report here in front of uh, you all, honorable guests, that look, uh, at JGU, we have a system of UAS, that is University Administrative Services. We profoundly select from a, from a rigorous process, young minds 
of, of uh, the, from the system and we are providing them training and we call them UAS, University Administrative System. So we are trying to give them exposure that how the university system is being run, uh, either adding them with the vice chancellor's office or registrar's office or dean's office and the uh, education uh, like examinations office. And what happened, this type of initiatives is a profound initiative which should be taken it out whatever the current existing uh, ranking system that need to be reformed, try to be more inclusive. And, and yes, very important point that there are 1,200, more than 1,200 universities, but we do not have sufficient good leaders who can lead this. Yes, there's a vacuum and the system needs to create such a, such a, such a process where we can generate leaders for the tomorrow, for shaping the education, for shaping the governance of education, for shaping the quality and the teaching of, of education across the globe. So I'm highly thankful to you all for sparing your time, for speaking on this, this enlightening topic, which is actually directly indirectly related to the education system, its quality, its research, everything is being covered here because when we talk about the ranking, ranking is a single umbrella which covers everything. So I'm highly thankful to all of you for sparing time and enlightening all of us. Thank you very much for your active participation, Sim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Thank you very much. Thank you. Success after all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Pandey, for a wonderful moderation. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.